imagine, including, you know, the color. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the kind of joke, but it was, you could get the Model T in any color you wanted as long as it was black. That's the only color they came in. And the reason it was black was because black is the fastest growing, uh, drying paint. And thus that would be, you know, increase your productivity. They, they wanted everything to be fast and they could get it out there. But Henry Ford used every economy, it could, economies of scales, et cetera, et cetera. And he reduced the price of the car over the course. This isn't uncommon. Products can start at a very high rate, a cost, of course, and, and they can go down over time. I remember the very first VCR that I knew anyone had purchased, and I'm pretty sure it was like $500, around $500. And of course, at some point, they were much more uh, reasonable than that. I think we probably bought our first one at 250 And then ultimately, of course, <clears throat> they lose all value. And nobody gives a damn about them anymore. But the Model T starts relatively expensive, but by the time we get to 1922, this is the peak of the production of the Model T, they had reduced the two-seat runabout to $260 per unit. And $260 was pretty much within the range of, the, of at least the average American. And of course, if you couldn't afford $260, you could buy one on the after, you could use market, you could buy one there too. So you know, Henry Ford did everything he could to make sure that this car was available uh, to as many people as possible. Now, the critical ultimate thing is that this car just begins to take over, basically. And so one of the things I want to tell you about is just the, the production. So um, the Model T is the second most produced car in the history of the world. So there's only been one car, one automobile, single model. And I have to tell you, there's a little interesting issue with the Model T. It is basically one model, although it could come in a variety of forms. Two seat, four seat, six seat, run, runabout. It could be a truck. I mean, you could uh, come you know, have a whole bunch of different kind of formations. But it was always the basic Model T that was going on there. But the Model T was produced between uh, eight, 1908 and 1926. And I think I did mention to you guys, you know, before that you know he really held on to the Model T way too long, losing a lot of really good automobile producers in the process. But during this model run, they will um, build 15.5 million units, 15.5 million units, making it the second most produced car in the history of automobiles. The number one most produced car in the history of the world is, guess one, two, three, those of you that said the Volkswagen Bug, congratulations, you are absolutely right. They produced over 20 million bugs. But it's kind of apples and oranges. At the time of the Model T, there's so many fewer cars in general. At the time of the, the VW, of course, a tremendous number of other cars that were also being produced, of course, but just none uh, quite in, in that same kind of model. Uh, anyway, here's, I think, the, the most telling of all the kind of statistics, and that is in the year 1922, the peak year of the Model T, the Model T represented more than, greater than, 50%, I think it was like 51% of all cars in the world, in the world. The Model T was the number one vehicle in the world by far. I mean, you walk into a parking, I always think that that, that makes me think like, how did this work? You walk out into a parking lot, of course, and you're looking at just, you know, line after line of black Model Ts, you know, how did you figure out which one was yours? And maybe it didn't matter, just pick the first one, they're all pretty much the same. But the Model T comes along, of course, and it is really uh, America, the world, not just America's first great car, it's the world's first great car. So the critical issue, of course, is that the, the, the Model T is a vehicle of change. So we need to kind of address the issue, what is it changing? And what it's changing, you know, so many things, it's going to change transportation, of course. And the basic thing that's going to happen here, of course, is that the horse and buggy days are over. I have a kind of Rockwellian image of what's going to happen here. So you've got Farmer Joe going down a country road, you know, in his wagon, pulled by his old horse, Bessie. And they're just cruising along, you know, at 2.5 miles an hour. When all of a sudden, here comes a Model T, the guy hits a Uga, you know, he's kicking up dust, Bessie freaks out, she runs down into the ditch. As the car's going by, Farmer Joe's flipping the guy off, of course, because he's pissed off. But, I mean, that's what was going to happen here, right? The horse and buggy days are over. Horses and buggies, you got to get the hell off the road, because here come the automobiles. And, of course, we should not feel sorry for horses at all, and the oxen, they had been the beast of burden, and... It's so brutal the way that they were treated in those days. If you guys have ever seen pictures, you know, from the late 19th century, even early 20th century, you see these horses, you know, in the cities, and they're pulling wagons, and their ribs are showing, and their heads are down, and their backs are swayed. I mean, they look horrible. And when they died, you know, they just kind of left them there in the in the in the on the road, or or they took them before they died to the glue factory to kind of turn them into whatever they're going to do with do with that. But you know, horses lived a miserable life, and so all of a sudden the horses are liberated. And although you can't really see it, if you look closely, every time an automobile or a truck goes, especially the trucks, 
Every time a truck goes by, the horses smile just a little bit, of course. And on the rare occasions when no one's looking, they actually rear up and clap their hooves like this because they're so happy that they are no longer having to be the beast of burden. Most horses in America today are pretty much pampered pets who are living pretty damn good lives relative, of course, to the lives that all the working animals would have had to do. And for them, what was the battle days? So transportation is going to change in a fairly radical way. Traffic is going to change. That's a big deal, you know. Um, I, I, there's a video, and this would be a fun one to search if you want to. So the guy put a movie camera on a streetcar on Market Street in San Francisco. And this is 1906, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is cool. So he just put his camera on it, and he just went down the street, and he rolled his camera. And when I do this, I mean literally, these guys would have to hand crank their cameras. And so you're just going to, I think the video lasts, I don't know what, it's like 10 minutes. It goes for a long way, and it's kind of fun just to check it out. But one thing that just impresses you, if you're from our modern world, you know, you just, you see the chaos of the street. Pedestrians are walking all over the place. And I, I think there's like a guy reading his newspaper, and just at the last second he looks up, oh my God, there's, you know, that kind of thing. There's a kid on a bicycle, and he's actually, you know, kind of, he, he sees the camera, so he wants to be in front of it. And there's wagons, and there's cars, and there's pedestrians, and there's, you know, and it just, and there's no one seeming to pay any attention to anything, you know, just crossing it. But, and it just seems like chaos, and it just seems like a, a, a way to kill people. But you have to understand that nothing's really going faster than about six miles an hour. I mean, that would have kind of been the maximum speed at that situation. So you can allow it. It's kind of like Main Street in Disneyland. You know, it can be chaotic, and it can have a streetcar or a trolley there. It's not going to kill people because, you know, everyone's going just walking and going so slow. So, you know, you could have it. By the way, that video, it's not just, of course, that you get to see what it looked like on the street, but that is San Francisco. I don't know how many, it's weeks before the earthquake comes. So, like, that's the last vision of Market Street in the pre-San Francisco earthquake moment. So, check it out if you want to and just get a sense of kind of what, what it was like to go down the street in early uh, 20th century America. Anyway, you know, traffic had to change, though, because all of a sudden, of course, there is... There, things are going faster. If two horses run into each other in an intersection at 2.5 miles an hour, you know, bloody no, there's something like that. But if two Model Ts run into each other at about 25 miles an hour, and I didn't tell you guys, but the, pretty much the max on the Model T is about 35 miles an hour. That's what they, you could, you know, spec them up. The kids did that and they'd spec them up to go faster. But really, we're talking pretty much about, you know, 35 miles an hour. Two Model Ts in an intersection together, you know, they're going to run into, that, that's a fatality accident, uh, accident right there. And they finally did begin to count the number of people killed in automobiles. And it was this, 1926 was the first year they gathered st statistics. And I'm a little troubled about what I'm about to tell you because it's a little too convenient. But I'm pretty sure in 1926, 26,000 Americans were killed in automobile accidents. So they began to realize that traffic is an issue. And, you know, a lot of it was just people falling out. of The cars would tip over. People would fall out of them. I think 11,000 of the 26,000 were children, and children just flew out of cars routinely. There's no such thing as a seatbelt. <clears throat> I was born and raised in the era before, really, the seatbelt usage in any kind of way. So it was a little baby or whatever, you know, kind of free roaming around the car. And I actually did get thrown out of a car one time, not in an accident, but uh, I didn't close my door in my dad's pickup truck, and my dad went around the corner really fast. I just kind of flew out the door, you know, Phew, there you go. And, you know, I, he wasn't going very fast, so nothing too bad was happening until he, he saw me and he, pat, he stopped and I, I slammed into the door. That was the only time that I kind of got hurt by the whole thing. But anyway, you know, kids could fall out of cars and cars would tip over and a lot of people died. So they had to begin to try to understand and manage the whole structure of traffic, basically. And as a symbol of this, in 1924, the General Electric Corporation came up with a traffic signal. So that's the beginning of that. And they had had things before. They'd have cops there, you know, and they'd have like a stop sign situation. And they even had these armatures that would go, this one would say go, and this one would say stop or something like that. But General Electric introduced a three-light system. The red light means stop. A lot of you don't seem to understand that, but the red light does indeed mean stop. The green light means go, and the yellow light means go like hell. You can all begin to know exactly what the light system is. So traffic had to change in a kind of dramatic way. Another thing that had to change were the roads. Ro roads had to adjust to the emergence of the, of the automobile. In the city, there was paving. You know, most of the major cities were becoming paved you know, at this time. But the second you ventured outside the city, you, you were on the realm of the dirt road. It's, it's dirt road America, basically. And, you know, if you got yourself a Model T, there was nothing more fun than to take that Model T out on the weekend and cruise out into the countryside and enjoy the hell out of yourself. And, you know, you guys, if you know about dirt roads, you know what I'm, you know, I'm talking about. I mean, they turn in, just a little bit of rain turns them into a quagmire, and all of a sudden you're finding yourself totally unable to go. And 
they would go out there and they'd get stuck, you know, and they didn't like that. They wanted to be able to go where they wanted to go. So there began to be pressure to begin to create paved roads that would begin to cross the nation. And this will begin to happen in, I'm running out of space here, but which one of these is the one that you race with? This one? <laughs> I think that's it. Um, just to put this on the board real quickly for you guys. In 1921, they will pass the Federal Highway Act. This kind of takes us back to the good old days, right? Bad writing on the board. How exciting is that? Uh, 1921, the Federal Highway Act. And the Federal Highway Act was designed to create for America the first national system of paved roads really since the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had done this a long time ago. I think maybe started in the Roman Republic with Via Appia, Via Postumia, paved roads, so well engineered that many of them are still there to, even to this day. They're narrow, you know, they're not going to be able to manage modern traffic, but still these enduring and well engineered roads. Well, the United States is going to kind of embark upon a, a campaign like this. And what it creates for us is what we call the U.S. Federal Highway System, the, the old federal highways. And they created highways, of course, transnational highways that would go north to south across the United States, east to west across the United States of America. Um, these highways will become famous in many ways, of course, and many of them are well known to us. The original highway was Highway 1, and Highway 1 is the East Coast, U.S. Highway 1. It goes all the way from Maine down to Florida, and I've actually been on parts of Highway 1. Sometimes it's just like total urban traffic, and there are a few places where it actually is like a, an actual open highway area. So Highway 1, of course, was on the East Coast. On the West Coast, the equivalent was Highway 101, U.S. 101, from Mexico all the way up, of course, to Canada. And in between, of course, a whole bunch of other highways. Um, among others that become famous, uh, Highway 395 is very much known to us. It, in its original iteration, it passed right by Palomar College. If you guys ever been on mission, and you see that sign, that's the historic Highway 101 coming out of San Diego, coming up through, ultimately, into Riverside County, into San Bernardino County. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but that sucker goes all the way to Canada, so it's you know, not just the local thing. Highway uh, 395 has been superseded in the south by both Interstate 15 and 215, so you know we, we kind of miss it there. Though are the little historical records of it in periodic places, but cross over Cajon Pass, and you pretty soon can you, you can go get off on Highway uh, 395 heading north to Lone Pine, Bishop, of course, Mammoth, Reno, and Canada, if you want to go. And, of course, a super beautiful highway, especially when it goes to the Owens Valley with the uh, Sierra Nevadas on one side of the whole thing. Anyway, so, you know, these highways, and um, just a couple more, um, Highway 50, Highway 40. These 